In the shadowed annals of Portugal's vibrant capital, Lisbon, there is a tale shrouded in an eerie cloak of mystery and dread. A story that unfurls the chilling legacy of Diogo Alves, a name whispered in hushed tones for generations. However, this story, carving a sinister mark on the city's landscape, would leave a trail of fear and intrigue that lingers in the windswept alleys of Lisbon today, bringing about so many unending questions. Who was this horrific man named Diogo Alves? What drove him to commit such grim acts? What darkness lurked within his twisted mind? Join us on this historic journey as we uncover these chilling answers, telling a tale of murder, intrigue, and a dreadful quest for answers that led scientists down a path that defied science and sanity. Some of the things discussed in this video may be offensive or disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. The Birth of Pancada The year 1810 in the lush landscapes of Samo, Spain, marked the arrival of a new charming baby boy named Diogo Alves to a wealthy family. Born to affluence, this new baby would spend his early years drenched in privilege as his parents provided him with the finest things, and the young boy found immense joy in playing with the family's horses. <laughs> However, fate had a different path in store for him, a path that would alter the course of his life forever. One fateful day, as Diogo rode his beloved horse around the sprawling estate, a dreadful mishap occurred. He lost control and was thrown from his steed, landing with a harsh impact on his head. This unfortunate incident left its mark on him, not just physically, but also in how his peers perceived him as they began to call him Pancada, a nickname that translates to blow to the head in their local dialect. Despite the challenges posed by his injury, Diogo persevered in his studies and completed his education. After graduation, his parents, concerned about his future, urged him to seek a job in Lisbon, Portugal and become self-reliant. Although hesitant initially, the prospect of independence and the allure of discovering a new city enticed the young Diogo. Thus, at the tender age of 19, he bid farewell to his hometown and embarked on a journey to Lisbon. In Lisbon, Diogo ventured into the world of employment initially finding work as a servant in the households of affluent families. However, it soon became evident that the job's responsibilities were outside his grasp. He would hop from one job to another, each ending in disappointment as he struggled to adapt to the job's demands. But as the challenges mounted, Diogo's frustration grew and his resentment towards his parents deepened, eventually causing him to sever ties with them and stop writing letters to them. Additionally, he sought solace in gambling and excessive drinking to better cope with his mounting frustration. But destiny weaved a similar thread amidst this turbulent period of his life. In a smoky gambling den, he crossed paths with Maria Pererina Gertrudes, the innkeeper, a beautiful, uneducated woman with a sharp tongue. Little did he know that this meeting would shape his life forever as inexplicably drawn to Maria, Diogo fell deeply in love with her. However, their union would come at a steep cost, and their entanglement with the shadows of destiny would soon unveil itself in ways they could never have anticipated. A Deadly Intertwined Fate Diogo and Maria Gertrude, much like star-crossed lovers, became inseparable. Their bond ran deep, and it wasn't long before Maria's influence led Diogo down a dangerous path, the world of crimes. Together, they embarked on a spree of petty theft throughout the city, and remarkably, they managed to evade capture. In 1836, Maria proposed a more elaborate plan to increase their ill-gotten gains, as stealing alone was no longer sufficient. 
she suggested that they target unsuspecting passersby along the route to the famous aqueduct of the Free Waters, a majestic structure in Lisbon, less than a half mile from the farms. This route was frequented by struggling farmers, making it a prime hunting ground for the duo. To execute this plan, Diogo had to steal and forge the keys to an underground gallery known as the Reservatorio de May de Aguas de Amoreas, which granted them access to the Aqueducto das Aguas Livres, otherwise known as the Aqueduct of the Free Waters. Furthermore, Diogo needed to secure employment near the Aqueducto das Aguas Livres to maintain proximity to their chosen crime scene. But one pressing concern loomed over them, ensuring they left no loose ends that could lead the authorities to the doorstep, as Diego harbored deep fears of being identified and apprehended, spurring them to craft an ingenious plan. Thus, Diogo devised a sinister yet nearly undetectable strategy in a chilling twist, leading their victims to commit suicide by plunging from the aqueduct. The Aqueducto das Aguas Livres was a 65-meter-long water supply project commissioned by King John V in 1731 under the guidance of the renowned Italian architect Antonio Canavari. Although initially unfinished and non-functional until 1748, at the time, it served as a conduit for water from other sources. Yet, the buildings flanked it lay mostly abandoned and lonely, offering the perfect backdrop for their sinister plan. With their dark plan set in motion, Diogo and Maria began preying on unsuspecting passersby along the path to the aqueduct. Their victims would be blindfolded and deceived into believing that they were on a harmless stroll, only to meet a tragic end at the edge of the aqueduct. As the number of deaths at the aqueduct continued to rise, whispers of these individuals committing suicide spread throughout the city. At the time, many attributed these tragic incidents to the dire financial and economic circumstances that plagued Lisbon. Nonetheless, the aqueduct gained infamy as a notorious location for such unfortunate suicides. However, alarmed by the growing suicides, the authorities took action, closing down the Aqueducto das Aguas Livres and sealing off its grim secrets for decades. The End of the Aqueduct Murderer The closure of the aqueduct brought about an unexpected turn of events for Diogo and Maria, but they were not ones to be defeated by adversity. Instead, they hatched a more daring plan, setting their sights on wealthier households to revive their source of livelihood by plotting to rob them during the night. Realizing the need for a formidable gang, they enlisted the help of a man named Solero to join their criminal escapades. Their strategy was ruthless, breaking into people's homes and killing them to evade detection. On one fateful day, after the robbery and murder of a local doctor and his family, they met their downfall as they were caught and arrested. However, some historical records suggest that Diogo narrowly escaped seeking refuge within the aqueduct for several days. Having been found at the aqueduct, coupled with his murders on the aqueduct, he earned the chilling moniker of the aqueduct murderer. Legend has it that between 1836 and 1840, Diogo Alves and his gang were responsible for 70 murders. Unfortunately, official records failed to conclusively prove Diogo and his gang did the murders on the aqueduct. However, the court charged Diogo, Maria, and Solero for their involvement in the brutal killing of the local doctor's four family members, their last victims, and justice did catch up with them. On February 19, 1841, Diogo Alves, Maria Gertrudes, and Solero stood trial for the grave charges of murder and robbery. Among the key witnesses was Maria Gertrude's 11-year-old girl, Maria da Consensau, whose testimony prompted a guilty verdict from the jury on the trio. Hence, Maria Gertrude received a lifetime exile sentence in an African colony. Meanwhile, Diogo and Solero faced condemnation to death by hanging. Thus, 
marking the conclusion of the dark chapter of the aqueduct murderer. A murderous head in a jar. Even in death, in an eerie twist of fate, Diogo Alves became infamous for his heinous crimes, finding posthumous fascination in the eyes of many. After his execution, scientists from the Medical Surgical School of the University of Lisbon embarked on a peculiar quest to understand the mind of this criminal mastermind. Hence, they chose to explore the intricacies of his brain by severing his head from his lifeless body and burying the remains in the Pesera Cemetery, also known as the Portuguese Cementerio dos Peseras. After his head was severed, they preserved it in a glass vessel filled with a chemical solution known as formaldehyde. Then, they placed it in the Anatomical Medical Theater of the University of Lisbon for tourist attraction and scientific study. The peculiar fascination surrounding Diogo Alves's head can be traced back to the prevailing pseudoscience of phrenology during his time. This controversial discipline believed that the shape of one's skull dictated one's mental and character traits. Thus, the morbid need to delve into the secrets locked within Diogo's head. Yet, the result of this grim study remained largely shrouded in mystery, with little recorded evidence of the research. Nevertheless, to this day, the head of Diogo Alves remains in a jar, suspended in formaldehyde, now serving as an unsettling tourist attraction at the university. Those who have ventured to witness this eerie relic at the Faculty of Medicine at Lisbon University describe it as resembling a potato with a face and hair. Meanwhile, others describe his expression as relatively eerily calm, with his lips pressing against the confining walls of the jar. So, what are your thoughts about this? Let us know in the comment section below, and remember to hit that subscribe button. To watch more insane and unique stories, click on the video options on the screen. You won't regret it.